Good morning to the DME Priest community, or good afternoon and good evening, good evening to you wherever you are in the world. Uh, welcome to this week's edition of the m and &E Thursday Talks on DME for Peace. Uh, these Thursday Talk webinars uh, are made possible with the support of the Carnegie Corporation of New York through the Peace Building Evaluation Consortium. My name is Jack Farrell, and I am the DME for Peace Project Manager at Search for Common Ground uh, here in Washington, D.C. Today, I am delighted to welcome uh, our guests, Swathi Massar and Joel Turner of IREX, who are going to lead a discussion on how community-driven approaches to development can foster greater cohesion. Just a note, you can ask questions throughout the webinar by writing your question in the question function on your GoToWebinar dashboard. It's only reading that statement again that I realize I say question far too often. Uh, I'm now gonna hand over to today's hosts, uh, Swathi and Joel. Uh, you're very welcome to the Thursday Talks and the floor is all yours. Hi everyone, this is Swathi and I'm here with my colleague Joel. We're super excited about this conversation today. Uh, this is a topic that we've been spending a lot of time thinking about and, and care deeply about and we look forward to having a lively and engaging conversation. So just for a uh, way of introduction and background, IREX is a 50 year old global international development and education nonprofit and we're based in Washington, DC, but have um, a presence globally. We've worked with an organization called Rural Education and Development, REED uh, Global, since 2012. We are, were both at the time grantees of the Gates Foundation and, and we're connected through that partnership. And one of the things that we witnessed with our partnership, through our partnership with REED is the level of impact that this organization is having on the communities that it works with. We were really astounded as development practitioners. We provided small grants of about $10,000 each to communities in rural Nepal and Bhutan. And we were really impressed to see how these communities took these investments and to this day are um, growing and strengthening those projects that that we um, helped to start with them, which is kind of unbelievable in our field. Um, how often do any of us go back and see that communities are continuing the investments that we started um, six or seven years ago? So we decided that we wanted to partner together to figure out what's, what's the secret sauce of this model? How can they, how have they been able to create this sustained change in communities and, and really help people uh, in highly marginalized and rural parts of the world come together, find solutions and sustain them. So I'll start by giving a little bit of background of what REED is. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, REED partners with rural communities in South Asia, specifically in Nepal, India, and Bhutan, to establish something called community libraries and resource centers, or REED centers. And these centers are holistic platforms that provide and serve all, provide services and serve all community members, women, children, youth, um, elderly people, people from different castes, people with disabilities, et cetera. And they really are platforms for communities uh, to help themselves transform economically and socially. Read was started about 27 years ago in Nepal. Um, and right now we are working with them to take this model outside of South Asia to Cote d'Ivoire and exploring other locations like Mongolia and Pakistan. Uh, let me give you an idea of what a REED Center looks like. When you enter a REED Center, it's not a traditional library at all. It's a place that's really vibrant, where you will see all sorts of community members there accessing books, uh, literacy opportunities, education activities, um, ICT, technology skills development, uh, animal husbandry, health services, basically whatever the community needs. Each, each read center um, has to have a main library section 
that houses books and, and educational activities, a children's section, a women's section, an ICT uh, uh, room with, that's equipped with computers and free access to the internet, a hall that has um, space for community events and other sorts of trainings, et cetera. Each REIT center also has to have one or more sustaining enterprises. These are small income generating activities that help the REIT center maintain its, op cover its operating costs. This is a really unique piece of the model that we don't often see in traditional development activities. And these sustaining enterprises are run by the community members themselves. And in rural communities in South Asia, this could be a storefront rental, um, an agriculture cooperative, a women's cooperative, it could be tractor rent renting, um, a guest house if it's in a tourist area, a uh, variety of things that make sense for that specific community. All REIT centers are managed uh, and owned by the community members themselves. They are managed by an inclusive group of people called a center management committee, and there should be at least one third uh, of the center management committee that's represented by women. Um, and it needs to be representative of, of all the different types of community members that, that exist in that village. So people from different political parties, different castes, et cetera. In the 27 years that REED has existed, not one center has ever closed. And so REED has about a network of 106 centers across South Asia, and that's also a remarkable outcome that we're very proud of. The process of establishing this center is also really important. Um, the REED country team partners with communities and spends about a year working with the community to understand if they are truly ready to own, sustain, and manage a REIT center. This happens in a variety of ways that we're ha happy to talk about more during the discussion um, section of this presentation. Uh, but just uh, in short, this process requires a lot of um, community buy-in and the community has to demonstrate that they're committed and, and, and want this center. And they do that in a variety of ways. One way is that the communities all have to provide a certain amount of um, cost share to um, establish and construct the centers. And because we're talking about rural, highly marginalized communities, this could be um, community members' time uh, to build the center. It could be bags of rice. It could be um, anything uh, to demonstrate that every household in that area wants the center and feels like it's it's theirs. Uh, they also have to demonstrate that they're prepared to have an inclusive approach and that it's not just one person in the community who wants the center, but a pretty broad representative group of community members. During this year, the Reed uh, country team also spends quite a bit of time with the community members to map out the different stakeholders that are active in and around that community, communities. So that could be the local government, it could be a local district agriculture office, health posts, schools, NGOs, others that are doing um, work and providing services. And this is really important to connect the community with the local system actors um, that, that, that exist. Uh, they also spend quite a bit of time with the community visioning and getting the community behind what this REIT Center could do um, to really help them. And we have a couple of pictures here as to what a REIT Center looks like. This is a newly renovated center in a highly earthquake affected area. And you can see that the um, ramps, disability accessible ramps uh, in, in the front of the center. And then this is what an inauguration looks like. This is really a proud moment for the community. Thousands of people gather together um, and are really excited about the potential and um, the opportunities that the REIT Center has for them. All right, so let's, we're gonna talk a little bit now about how we've structured uh, this case study. 
And again, you know, one of the things that really caught IREX's attention and wanting to better understand the, the read model is, is seeing, you know, how after 27 years, not a single center is closed. And we really wanted to kind of understand, you know, what's kind of what's the secret behind this and, and, and really understanding what part, you know, what's part of the process and how uh, the read team, um, you know, uh, engages these communities and, and what are sort of the elements of success for these communities. So. The study aimed, you know, to better understand the practice of the read model, um, how centers operate, what kinds of community capacity and development outcomes uh, have taken place in the villages where read centers exist, uh, and what makes these centers unique platforms for community development. So we had three questions. Uh, how do read country staff facilitate the development of read center? Uh, how are read centers managed, operated, and, and how are uh, services delivered? And then how are community development outcomes created and what allows read centers to be sustained? And I will say we chose to focus specifically on Nepal, even though read operates in a couple other countries and we're and and read is expanding to a few additional. Uh, but we focused on Nepal particularly because of its long track record and and we felt that it was sort of a, a sort of a rich uh, ground to study seeing is how there's over 60 centers in operation in the country. So this study um, pulls from community development literature as a mechanism really for guiding our analysis and particularly lean on uh, Robert Chaskin's work on, on building community capacity. So you'll see elements of this in our findings and, and Swathi will actually touch on this a little bit later when we start going into some of our additional findings. But we focus on this notion of community capacity, essentially as a way to describe the potential that communities have to solve common problems um, and to eventually create positive change. So in this context of the case study, we, we really view community capacity both um, as an outcome, but also as kind of this causal link or this causal factor that can contribute to, you know, downstream outcomes. So um, I think this graphic really kind of sums up how this whole operation works. Um, and what we're going to do is really explain the different findings in the context of, of this graphic. Um, so there are specific elements of the read model uh, that we feel direct are directly responsible for achieving community capacity outcomes. Um, and these community capacity outcomes in turn, you know, contribute to achieving development outcomes uh, that we see ultimately help sustain the operation of these centers. But one of the things that we also wanted to see is how do these gears actually get you know, get moving? How do they operate? And what we found is really the, the Read Nepal team um, are the catalysts in this process. So I wanna, you know, Swathi talked a little bit about kind of, kind of illustrated how the Read um, team operates. And I wanna kind of revisit some of that, but really focus on a couple key aspects of what the Read team does uh, that helps move this process along. So we found uh, that the Read Nepal team uh, plays a critical role in catalyzing both the development and programming, but also the sustained operation of these centers. They do it in a couple of ways. One is through ongoing coaching and mentorship. So Swathi mentioned that in each community, the Read Nepal team works closely with that community for over a year. And so, the read team really believes that you know community members have to be equal partners in the establishment of uh, their own center so this is a concept that is i think new in many contexts uh, really being very intentional about engaging communities at every step um, and so as a result it requires a lot of coaching and support which the read team has positioned itself to to offer that support the second is an uncompromising adherence to readiness. So making sure that the community is ready to own, operate, and sustain uh, these centers. Um, 
So this involves working with the community to, to find resources, you know, demonstrating an ability to solve issues or overcome uh, issues, pre-existing issues that might exist in the community, really making sure that the community understands that to operate these centers, that all people within the community have to have an equal stake in the establishment of the center. And then last, um, this unwavering commitment that all community members have a voice in this process. They all have skin in the game. And the Reed team is really core to making sure uh, that everyone has, has a voice in the establishment and the ownership of these centers. So we'll spend a few minutes now talking about the evidence that we saw of these four elements of community capacity that Joel spoke about a minute ago. And these four elements that we observed are sense of community, shared commitment, ability to solve problems, and access to resources. So in terms of sense of community, we saw this because um, women, men, uh, elderly people, young people, repeatedly talked about how the Reed Centers allowed them for the first time for many of them to come together to interact positively in a safe space. Um, this process that the Reed Centers um, have, you know, uh, this year-long process that, that the Reed teams uh, take the communities through allows the communities to spend time together to talk through the vision, a common vision for the Reed Centers and how this can benefit everyone. The second piece on shared commitment, uh, many community members talked about how the Reed Center, because it brought everybody together in a safe space uh, for the purpose of helping them figure out how to, uh, how to help themselves, how to, um, develop a common vision oriented towards social and economic transformation. This really solidified um, a mission among community members uh, that really didn't exist before. This also provides them a space and a mechanism through which they can work together to solve problems. Community members have the opportunity to talk to different resource providers that are available in their community to help bring agricultural training to farmers who need help uh, to provide uh, health awareness campaigns or, or uh, health camps to help women uh, understand uh, sexual and reproductive health, have conversations that they were never able to before. And finally, it's a mechanism for community members to access resources that they haven't been able to uh, in the past, they feel more connected to the local systems actors, as we talked about previously, local government, schools, health posts, etc. And as Joel mentioned, this platform also through this community developing community capacity, it generates a host of really important development outcomes. We've touched upon this idea of cohesion, greater cohesion, greater sense of community trust um, and also more positive interaction. Community members from a variety of backgrounds are coming together to figure out how to make everyone's lives better. And this process is acknowledged that it doesn't happen uh, overnight, but it, it requires intention and careful facilitation and time. A greater sense of collective efficacy. We've talked about how uh, community members now believe that they have the power, a sense of agency to create positive change in their communities. Reed centers are seen as first responders during times of crises. In uh, communities that were highly affected by the earthquake, the Reed centers were the first points um, communities wanted to rebuild after the earthquake, even before their homes because they see the Reed Centers as platforms for opportunity. We see women and youth who um, in, in these rural areas are um, vulnerable to a variety of uh, threats, uh, labor migration, uh, women who are illiterate, who are stuck at home, are now taking on leadership positions in their communities 
young people as well. We have REIT centers that are entirely operated by people under the age of 30. Uh, there's a community where the young people led a fundraising campaign uh, along with their local government and raised $90,000 for the REIT center, um, which is remarkable if you think about in that community, it's primarily um, uh, located right next to a brick kiln. So you can imagine the level of poverty in that community. We also see stronger linkages with the local government, which um, we'll talk more about in a minute. And finally, we see how community capacity, um, these four elements that are created through the REED model allows community members to continue to grow and adapt their REED centers. Many of the REED centers that were started 10 years ago as um, small rooms with a couple of um, core activities have really blossomed into vibrant um, community spaces because as the community members come and seek benefit, they realize the value in investing in these important platforms and they continue to expand them. We also see more established centers uh, helping to establish satellite centers in nearby villages um, because the nearby areas see the value in, um, in, in having such a platform and also want to create something similar for their, for their villages as well. Um, and we also see how, you know, these, uh, by creating development outcomes, having better services, communities becoming literate, um, healthier, uh, more economically prosperous, the communities continue to invest um, in these resources, which then uh, and extend services to more and more community members and, and helps really continue to build community capacity. So with that, um, I think we will turn it over for a few questions. Great. Well, thank you, Swathi, and thank you, Joel, for a great presentation. Uh, the questions have been coming in thick and fast, um, but for those of you who are unfamiliar with the Thursday Talks, um, you can submit your question in two ways. The first is through the question function on GoToWebinar, which people have been using to type their question. The second is to click on the little hand icon on your GoToWebinar dashboard. That will uh, raise your hand and it will allow us to unmute your microphone so you can ask your question live. When you do submit your question, we ask that you submit your name and affiliation. Uh, and just a note, these talks are recorded and posted on the DMF Peace Media Gallery. So those who are not able to join us at this time can go back and listen to the presentation and the discussion and learn from our wider engagement. Now, uh, guys, our first question comes from uh, Mindy Reeser, who is the Vice President uh, of Global Peace Services USA. And Mindy writes, how are the materials for the Read Library chosen? How are users guided in the use of materials? And are users encouraged to write their own concerns and thoughts? So the Read Centers are... Um, provide services in a variety of ways. There are core programs that uh, the Read Country team, Read Nepal, helps to um, uh, the center management committees and the Read Center staff to establish, for example, programming on basic literacy and numeracy, as well as uh, women's empowerment work. Um, other than that, because the services and programs offered at the Read Center really need to reflect the needs of that community. They, uh, the center management committee reaches out to local service providers to, um, to provide those programs. Uh, for example, in a lot of these rural areas, uh, community members seek out services to help them with uh, respond to agriculture development questions and, and needs. And so, Oftentimes the Reed Center will work with the local government and the local district agriculture office to, um, to provide training that res directly responds to those needs. Um, many Reed Centers have uh, social mobilizers whose responsibility it is to go door to door and reach out to every single household on a regular basis to identify needs. And so, uh, and they will often collect these queries and um, 
and then figure out how to respond to these questions that um, uh, that that the households are are asking for. And so that may happen through a variety of ways. It might be that the REIT Center will uh, call upon a technical expert to go to specific households and provide information or organize a mass training or workshop or something like that at the REIT Center. The way that the community provides feedback on this service is, these services is quite interesting. So in addition to having a main center management committee at the REIT Center, each REIT Center has a variety of subcommittees subcommittees on topics related to services. So there could be something on agriculture, women's empowerment, ICT, um, and it also could be related to specific groups who are in the community. So maybe there might be a subcommittee for people with disabilities. Each of these subcommittees is responsible for monitoring specific services or needs related to their, their topic at hand. And then, each of the subcommittees has a representative that attends the monthly center management committee meeting to provide feedback on how those services are going. And so let's say, for example, um, the Women's Empowerment Subcommittee thinks that the services, that the program isn't quite meeting a specific need or needs to address another topic or isn't inclusive of all women. Um, they will provide that feedback to the um, center management committee during that monthly uh, meeting so that the center management committee is aware of what's going on. And there are a couple other ways that uh, the REIT centers ensure transparency. Uh, every month, they uh, each center has a, a kind of a board of uh, users, user profiles, um, other sorts of statistics, the budget, for example, of each REIT center and how the how and the expenditures, so that community members really trust that the center is delivering for them. Great, thank you, Swati. And I, I guess I want to build on this question, something you touched on. You talked about sort of um, the community outreach, the door-to-door -door outreach, and obviously the standard or the sort of success of read centers is going to vary depending on where you are. And I was wondering if you could elaborate on what makes some read centers more successful than others. Uh -huh. Perhaps, Tina, would you like to, to weigh in on that? We are lucky to have the executive director of read global here with us as well. You're very sure. welcome, Tina. Thank you. <laughs> um, yeah. So I would say that, Really, um, and this is sort of how the model has evolved over time, but we've seen that the leadership of, um, you know, so the, the center management committee that Swathi talked about earlier, um, you know, having a really strong center management committee that understands um, how to sort of mobilize local resources and develop local partnerships is, I think, the real key to making sure that a center is both self-sustaining um, but that also it's providing programs and services that are truly meeting the needs of that community and that can evolve over time. Um, so for us as an organization, you know, we know now that we really need to do a lot of capacity building for that, that center management committee. And then, of course, all the subcommittees that um, Swathi mentioned, too, um, and that there also needs to be a change in leadership over time. It can't be the same people, um, you know, the same president of that committee for years and years. There needs to be a change in leadership so that other people in the community get a chance to um, really lead, but then also have a different perspective. Um, but it's really that ability to, to form those local partnerships that makes the centers most vibrant, most relevant, and sustaining over time. Thank you very much, uh, mm -hmm. Tina. Um, our next question is a raised hand from Jindra Sekan. And Jindra, your microphone is now live, so feel free to ask your question to today's hosts. Hi, I'm delighted by this talk. My name is Jindra from Valuing Voices, and there's so little really sustained programming out there that we can prove. So my question is actually twofold. One is, what has been the financial and technical commitment of Reed International to these uh, to these centers for the 27 years? And the second is, 
how have you actually measured the sustainability? Is it simply um, the fact that they're still standing and still providing services, or do you have kind of objective data to show that it's been the result of what you guys catalyzed? Thank you very much. Yeah. Do you want to answer the first part, Tina? Yeah, the financial commitment, sure. Mm -hmm. um, so so this has actually evolved a bit over time. As I was mentioning earlier, um, as we've noted that the Center Management Committee is so critical to the long-term success of a REED Center, in the last seven or eight years, we've been around 27 years, in the last seven or eight years, we sort of changed the way, the kind of commitment that we made to, to communities. In our earlier years, we used to work very, very closely with the communities um, for about you know a year to two years until the center was up and running, we would do uh, and and the financial commitment, sorry, would be us helping raise money to construct and equip the center with the community making a co-investment of at least 10 to 15 percent, um, which would usually mean they would do some sort of local fundraising, donate the land, um, a lot of times donating the labor as well. Um, we've had communities that have, have raised, as Swathi had mentioned, one community raised about $90,000 that actually covered the whole construction of the center. We've had other communities have raised like almost half of the total funds needed um, to construct a new center. But our commitment is, you know, we, we expect at least 10 to 15 percent of the total cost from the community. And we usually help raise the funds, whether it's from individuals in the U.S. or institutional donors like the Gates Foundation um, to support the rest of those startup costs. And then now what we do is we actually provide about two to three years of programmatic support in that community. And that's that's a shift that happened for us in the last seven or eight years because we could see that some centers were doing really well at forming those local partnerships and others maybe weren't doing that well. And so we wanted to make sure that all of the centers really had vibrant programming. So now we also make a commitment. We try to make a five-year commitment anytime we go into a new community so that we can not just get the center up and running, but then make sure that there's a certain amount of programming that is being offered consistently that can meet community needs, but that we're also working with that community to build their capacity to um, form the local partnerships, understand how to do strategic planning for the center and really evolve the offerings over time. And then after that, the idea is that um, the sustaining enterprise for the center should really fund the basic operating costs and a lot of the programming that happens should be happening through partnerships that actually don't cost the center any money. Do you want to take the second question, Swathi? Yeah. Okay. So during the study, we were looking at sustainability in, in three ways. Um, one is obviously the financial sustainability that these centers are viable, um, financially viable, and they keep the lights on. Uh, but the most important piece, as Tina describes, uh, is really looking at the level of ownership that the uh, communities have over the centers. How are they um, providing services? Are they vibrant spaces where more and more community members are engaged and um, involved and volunteering their time, uh, visiting uh, the centers, accessing services, et cetera? Um, and then, you know, also looking at the level of partnerships that exist in and around the centers uh, is th that third piece. The other way you can really look at the sustainability of these centers, as we described, this community capacity, this engine for community development is quite contagious. Um, in a lot of communities where uh, the REIT centers have, ex have been in existence for a while, you see a lot of um, these satellite centers popping up in and around them. Uh, neighboring villages who you know, come to access the main REIT center, realize the benefit of having something like this and want to establish REED centers of their own. And what you see in a lot of uh, REED communities is that they're inspired by their peers to take on this type of work themselves. Uh, for example, the community that raised $90,000 to establish a REED center inspired communities in earthquake affected areas um, in, in different regions to do something similar. And so, you know, what you see is that uh, this community capacity really motivates uh, and, and inspires um, other villages to, to take on this work. And you can kind of see it over time how Reed, um, Reed's model and its network of centers is expanding and, and thriving. 
Great, thank you guys. I think you actually answered quite a few of the questions which have been asked in the background, uh, particularly around one, uh, what kind of support uh, does Read Global provide um, from a programmatic perspective and when does it know uh, when a Read Center is ready to sort of be locally owned? And the second is uh, around strategic planning, which a couple of people asked around and what kind of training you guys give. Uh, so it's really interesting to hear. Um, the next questions come from Damir uh, Asenaliev. Uh, apologies, Damir, if I butchered your name. Um, but Damir comes from Cipri and, and asks two questions. The first is, uh, how do you, how did you measure your outcome indicators? And the second is, what is the coverage of the read centers? For example, what percentage of the adult population uh, attended one of the centers? Um, okay. So uh, I can probably talk in general terms about Reed's kind of approach to monitoring evaluation, but Tina, feel free to jump in yeah, yeah. since you obviously have a closer look at that. So the Reed centers um, collect data on participation and impact of services on a monthly basis. And they, as I mentioned earlier, they uh, place a lot of that information in an open and accessible space that the community community members can um, see and also understand and digest. Uh, in addition to that, the read country teams also have um, a, a framework through which they collect data um, on an annual basis to really understand what needs to evolve and change in the read centers. Tina, perhaps there's more. Yeah, yeah. So what I would say is, um, so when we when we were a grantee of the Gates Foundation, we actually created um, a monitoring and evaluation system. The first data that, or the first report we published was in 2013, and we're about to publish our second one based on data we recently collected. The outcomes that we measure across all of the read centers, it's um, increased economic empowerment, increased women's empowerment increased access to knowledge and information, and then the increase in community engagement over time. Um, and so, you know, there's a variety of different um, outcomes under those sort of four broad categories, um, but that data, in addition to all of sort of like the regular output data that we're collecting on a monthly basis, or rather the centers are collecting and sharing with us, um, our teams go out and collect that data in a variety of ways. Some of it happens through focus group discussions. Some of it is, is through surveys, which can be either anonymously filled out um, by, by people in the community, or um, if, if people are illiterate and they need help filling out the forms, then our volunteers or team members will, will do that. And then that data is anal analyzed. And we do that right, right now. The goal is to do that every three or four years. We're a little bit late on the most recent round because we decided not to do it in the year of the earthquake. Um, it just was, there was too much happening after the earthquake to be able to, to have our teams focus on, on collecting data. Um, and, and, you know, as, as Swati mentioned, we're sort of even how we um, how we collect data and what we're collecting data on is changing over time. We've started to do more youth programming. Um, we have like, you know, sometimes we do specific data collection around a particular grant. Um, and so in recent years, we've started doing more of the youth development and sports for development programming, um, particularly in Nepal. And so we have different, you know, outcomes that we track related to that. Great. Thank you very much, guys. Uh, I think this sort of feeds on to the next question, which comes from Beth Head. And Beth writes, um, could you share a little bit more information about how you measure collective efficacy and cohesion? And uh, thank you for a great uh, and very useful presentation. Yeah. So what we uh, looked at for greater cohesion, we really um, were looking at observing um, uh, examples of uh, community members describing uh, greater trust uh, in in uh, yeah social trust in their communities um, uh, greater to increased tolerance um, and then really looking for a sense of community um, so we were in our um, qualitative research we were kind of tracking uh, those specific instances that that came up um, Joel do you have anything else to add to that pretty much yeah. 
And I would actually just say that, um, sorry, this is Tina. When we measure, so one of the outcomes that ReGlobal measures, which is not necessarily connected with the study that IRX did, was just that um, sense of community engagement and how it increases over time. So what we're looking at, one of the things we track is um, the number of, of people in the community who report that they feel a sense of ownership and belonging to the mm -hmm. community. Um, and that's usually a very high percentage in, in all of the communities. We also look at things like how many initiatives got launched through the center. So community members coming together and deciding that they wanted to tackle child labor in their community or, you know, mm -hmm. Um, like trafficking issues. Um, and so a lot of times the center will actually serve as the platform for communities to come together and, and launch their own initiatives to tackle big challenges in their community. So we look at things like that as well. Yeah. Great, thank you very much, guys. Uh, the next question comes from Ted Perlmutter uh, of the Columbia Negotiation and Conflict Resolution Program. And Ted asks, what methodology do you use to map community resources? And is it uniform across all your uh, work in Nepal? Yeah. Um, so this is a kind of a process that the Reed Country team uh, takes on, initiates with the communities. Uh, they spend a lot of time uh, doing, I think, a pretty uh, straightforward stakeholder mapping process um, where they work with these community leaders to reach out to the different um, government and um, nonprofit or kind of civil society uh, stakeholders that exist. Uh, they also um, make sure that when they're um, involving these stakeholders, that these stakeholders have a specific, um, that they're part of the structure of the Reed Center Management as well. So each um, center management committee is guided by this, um, not quite a subcommittee, but this group called the Knowledge Management Committee. And so the Knowledge Management Committee will have representatives from all these different stakeholder groups that uh, the Reed uh, Country Team and Center Management Committee has mapped out together. And this body is meant to be kind of an advisory body that also provides feedback to the Center Management Committee about important services and trends and data that, that could be used to inform um, the programs and services that the Reed Center provides. And so it's uh, not a complex process at all. It's actually quite a straightforward and simple process to map out those stakeholders. But I think the idea of having them part of the management committee allows for greater um, ownership and also uh, engagement from the stakeholders in what happens at the Reed Center. Yeah, and this is Tina. I'm just chiming in to say that in, in Nepal, um, one of the things they do uniformly do in addition to um, sort of the longer process of um, you know weighing in and kind of doing a mapping of resources, they bring together all the different stakeholders in a community meeting. Once we're at a point where we're pretty confident we're gonna actually work with a community to launch a center and we feel like the commitment is there and they've really thought out the whole process, um, we invite everyone to a meeting where um, we talk about all the different assets that are already available, what are the resources already there, and then what are sort of the needs. Um, and in that, in that meeting, what ends up happening is that the different, you know, there might be government officials from the Department of Agriculture or, you know, Ministry of Education. Um, there might be teachers there, um, different community leaders from other local NGOs. And as we're talking about what are the needs and, and what are, you know, what's already available, those people tend to kind of step up and say, okay, we can take on this and, you know, we'll maybe donate um, resources to make this possible in, in the center and we'll make sure that there's a childcare worker who can, um, you know, whose salary will be covered by the local government. So it, it's sort of a very, I think, a very powerful process because it doesn't just tell us what's available and who are the stakeholders. It's actually people standing up and making a commitment to be part of that process and really becoming invested in the success of the center right then and there. Great. Thank you very much, guys. Uh, thank you to Swathi and Joel for your amazing presentation today. And thank you, Tina, for, for joining for the question and answer session. It's obvious you guys are doing amazing work and it was a pleasure to learn more about it. Uh, on this webinar and thank you to our fantastic audience as always for asking 
a ton of questions uh, and unfortunately we're at time for today and we won't be able to get to them but we'll add them to the comment section on the DME Freeze recording so hopefully you guys can continue the discussion online. Um, lastly, uh, I just want to remind you that these Thursday talks happen most Thursdays at 10 a.m. Eastern. We're going to be back on October 25th at 10 a.m. Uh, Eastern as Rebecca Grubel of the United States Institute of Peace will lead a discussion on adapting in step lessons learned from adapting a multi-country project's m and &E framework. Um, we'll have more information about that online in the next 10 days, um, but we hope to see you online then. Uh, thank you again to today's guests, and uh, I hope you all have a great rest of your week. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.